Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to Data Wrangling. If you are not here to learn to wrangle data for the purposes of later visualizing it, you still have time to escape. I can turn around and you can still leave. But if you are here for this, then you are in the right place and I'm glad to see you. My name is Rachel Shadone. I run a convenient sized consultancy here in Portland where we do things with data, both science and visualization, and also user experience research, mostly of the ethnographic persuasion. You can find me on Twitter at Rachel Shadone and at Akashic Labs. I tweet a lot more from Rachel Shadone. The tweets, you know, come for the, uh, the visualization and the social justice and stay for the Star Trek and gardening. All right, so let's jump right into it. What do you need for a data visualization? It's a good place to start, right? But lots of different people call data lots of different things, and there are a, a spectrum of, of quality and quantity. So I want to talk about some of the ways that we can categorize data. So the two spectrums that I find helpful, we have the qualitative quantitative spectrum. And Wikipedia has a really fantastic article on some of the, the minutia of these various things. But you go from qualitative data, names, often free text categories, all the way to quantitative data, what we often think of as data, and that's numbers upon which you can do lots of statistics. This spectrum is largely defined on what kind of statistics you can use for these kinds of data. But there's another spectrum of data, and this is maybe more relevant for the process of data wrangling. And that is the spectrum from structured data to unstructured data, or if you'd like to think of it the other way, from unstructured data to structured data. Unfortunately for us, the overwhelming majority of the data in the world is unstructured. Books, blogs, video, images, music, most of that is largely unstructured. Whereas on the other end, you have things that are more or less ready to be visualized. Databases, spreadsheets, XML, HTML, that kind of stuff. Now what do I mean when I say structure? So unstructured data is like a pile of silverware at the flea market. Uh, if, I, if I gave you a pile of silverware from the flea market and told you, bring me all of the salad forks, you would have to take up each piece. Is this a salad fork? Rachel, really, well, what's a salad fork? Like, this has, it's definitely a fork, but is it a salad fork? And you'd have to do that with every piece. It's possible that you could find some efficient way of doing it, but really, you're going to be doing a linear scan of this pile of flea market silverware. So it's not easily searchable. Most data fits into this category. Structured data is like silverware in your silverware drawer where it's nicely organized and you've got a slot for your, your salad forks and you've got a slot for your dinner forks and you've got a slot for your soup spoons and you've got a slot for the random spoons that don't go with anything else. The point is it has a consistent underlying organization. It's searchable. If I tell you, bring me all of the teaspoons, you can just reach into the teaspoon slot and bring me all of the teaspoons. And it took you, you know, 10 seconds. It's great. So CSVs, databases, all of these are structured data. It's searchable. It's really nice. So what kind of data can we visualize? Um, when a lot of people think of data visualization, they think of numbers, structured numbers, tables. Um, a table is actually a kind of visualization, so it's one of the, the earliest starting points. So we know that we can visualize structured quantitative data. You can also visualize structured qualitative data. A lot of categorical data can be, can be visualized. In fact, really all of it, you just have to figure out a visualization that fits. But what about these guys? What do we do with the unstructured data? <laughs> Pretend it doesn't exist, exactly. Uh, well, that's unfortunate because there's a lot of interesting data out there. Fortunately for us, 
you can transform unstructured data into structured data. Mostly, it's a matter of how much effort do you want to put into structuring this data. You can uh, you go through and, and tag videos on YouTube. That's adding structure to data. You can uh, break books into tokens. That's structuring data. Lots of different ways to structure data. All data can be structured. And thus, all data can be visualized. It's just how much effort, time, and energy do you want to put into structuring your data. So any data can be structured, and thus, any data can be visualized. <laughs> now, how do you structure data? You need some kind of model that will underlie the structure. Remember I said that structured data has a consistent underlying organization? A model is how you make your consistent underlying organization. So on the left here, we have a person. That's my sister, isn't she adorable? She's a librarian, she's great. On the right, we have a model of a person and we choose the things that we think are important to represent of this person. So maybe they have a unique identifier. Um, lots of us have social security numbers, some of us have driver's license numbers, some of us have passport numbers. There are lots of different kinds of identifiers that you can put on a person, although it should be noted that social security numbers cannot be used as identifiers for legal reasons unless it has to do with taxes. So just in case you were thinking, ah, oh, I've got a ready-made identifier, not that one. Oh, I didn't know that. So it's <laughs> So for those of you who may not have heard that, there are actually apparently no penalties for using the social security number as an identifier for other than tax related information. But I advise against it. Ah, I didn't so not guaranteed to be unique. So there are lots of reasons a social security number is not necessarily a good identifier. But moving on. So there are other things that we might care about about a person. They have a name, they have an age, maybe they have a height, a profession, things they like to do, a place of their citizenship, uh, a native language, all of these things. But this is an abstraction of a person. It is just what we have chosen to represent about them. With that information, we can then take all of this unstructured data and mash it into something that we can use then to visualize. We could do this for all of you. You are not abstractions, you are people. But we can build an abstract data model that represents an OS bridge attendee. In fact, most of this is pulled from the thing you had to fill out when you were registering. Your name, your email address, your home address, your company, your Twitter website age, gender, years in open source, food preference, which is a really interesting category, uh, and then I tacked on a few because, you know, more data, why not? But if I were going to go around and collect all of this information from everyone, or even if I just went through the registration database, it's not guaranteed to be structured consistently. Uh, the gender field is a really good example of this. It's a free form field, and so people can put in whatever they want, which is a great policy, and I recommend you adopt it. But from a, a perspective of visualization, it introduces a lot of opportunity for, um, well, misspellings, for instance. Uh, every time someone spells something differently, even if it's not wrong, if it's just like uh, adding an OU in color instead of a O, <laughs> then that introduces another, what the computer will view as another category. So when you're transforming information into structured data, you want to make sure that you're doing it consistently. How, whatever model you choose, you have to go through and, and make sure that it fits itself. And that's a really big problem that you can spend many hours working on. And it's what scripts are for. Scripting languages are excellent for making things 
less messy that way. There are lots of ways to compare strings to see if, oh, do we really mean the same thing when we write this? So when you are structuring data, consistency, consistency, consistency. So we know now that for data visualization, you need structured data. Mm, but is that enough? What do you need for a good visualization? And I'm not, I'm not going to take you through the annals of awful visualizations. The internet is full of them, much like it's full of annals of many awful things, including sleazy UI. Uh, but what do you need for a data visualization to be really good? I want to talk to you about the dimensionality problem. A dimension is just a variable in the data. If you work with tables or spreadsheets or databases, it's just usually one column. You can make dimensions by combining columns, or you can take a column and split it into two dimensions, but more or less one column, one dimension. In our model, each one of those things is a single dimension. The problem is that dimension, uh, dimensionality increases really quickly. Now, what do I mean by dimensionality? That's the number of relationships between dimensions in the data. So here we have our, our little model. And I have constructed a table with one little blue block for each of the pairwise relationships in the data. So if I want to compare any two dimensions, there's one block for that. This is a lot of pairwise relationships. 78 pairwise relationships, and that's just the pairwise ones. That's only looking at relationships of two dimensions. You can also look at relationships between three dimensions or relationships between four dimensions. There are a lot of dimensions you can look at. This is problematic for a number of reasons. One, as an analyst, that's a crap ton of stuff to sort through. Like, 78 dimensions? That's a lot of work. Do I really want to make you know, potentially 78 different visualizations to explore these relationships? That's where questions come in. Questions reduce dimensionality. For example, let's say that we wanted to look at how food preferences are distributed among languages and projects. Are vegetarians and vegans, perhaps, uh, do they cluster around certain, po certain projects? I don't know. It's an interesting thing to ask. That question narrows down the number of dimensions we have to look at from 78 to 2. We could look at the distribution of languages and projects distributed geographically by looking at home address and comparing it to favorite languages and current projects. Again, reducing from 78 dimensions that we have to sift through to two dimensions that we have to sift through. It's much nicer, much nicer. And it's important for data analysis because of the multiple comparison problem. Now, this is not a statistics lecture. I am not a professional statistician. I'm a hobby statistician. <laughs> but in a nutshell, the multiple comparisons problem is if you look at enough different relationships, you're going to find a significant pattern or well, you're going to find a pattern between in, in a relationship just by random chance. There are ways when you're doing statistics to account for this fact. But with visualization, you have to be running your statistics in addition to doing your visualization. So it's better to start with questions. This is important for data analysis, but it's really important for visualization for this reason. So a view is the smallest unit of a visualization. Um, it might be a chart, a bubble chart, maybe, or a map, or maybe a network visualization. Each of these is one view on the data. And it's especially important to reduce the dimensionality for this reason, let's count. Count the number of dimensions that we've got encoded here. 
So a little context for this visualization. This is one that I did as part of my master's thesis at the University of Dundee. We were studying a small online text-based fighting RPG in which players played plants and battled each other. Now, like in many RPGs, for those of you who are familiar, you have a variety of skills that you can train in. And there are lots of different methods for choosing what to train and lots of strategies around it. But in this game, you can train um, your attack, your defense, or your speed. And each of the, the bubbles on this chart represent a single instance of training. This is one of the top players, by the way, uh, which is why his chart is so completely overloaded with stuff. He was playing all the time. So we've got one dimension along the horizontal axis, and that's encoding date, the day. So that's one dimension. We have a second dimension encoded along the vertical axis, and that's the time of day. So you can actually see when during the day he's playing. This is server time, by the way, not adjusted to his time zone. So it's two dimensions. We have a third that I've encoded as the color of of the bubble. And we have one more dimension. The size of the bubble indicates how many points the player paid to train and therefore how many points they got out for that particular training instance. So that's four dimensions. Four dimensions. That's not very many. In fact, compared to 78 in our, in our OS bridge model, that's hardly any at all. And in one view, that's about what you're limited to. Now, if you are really clever and you do a really good job encoding your data, you can maybe squeeze out five. I have heard rumors of people squeezing out as many as seven, but I don't believe them. So for a single view, you are really limited in the number of dimensions of data you can show. And because you're limited in the number of dimensions of data that you can show, you are limited in the number of relationships between data dimensions that you can explore. And that is why reducing dimensionality is really important for visualization in specific. So what do you need for a good data visualization? Got your structured data, which you have consistently structured. You have tried to remove all of the weird data artifacts. And then you have good questions. Questions that let you narrow in on a particular set of dimensions that are of interest to you or whoever you're making the visualization for. All right, so let's say we've got our structured data. We've got our good question. We know what dimensions that we care about. And we want to choose a kind of view to visualize it. How do we choose? There are other categories of data. I told you there are many spectrums, right? Other ways of looking at it. So we talked about quantitative data. And this is probably what we're most familiar with. These kinds of things have been showing up on standardized tests since we were very little. Charts, bar charts, uh, scatter plots. These are common in our cultural currency. So in our, our top, top left there, we've got a bar chart. The top right is a scatter plot. And the bottom one is one we may not be as familiar with. That's a parallel coordinate plot. These are all different ways of displaying quantitative data. Um, also, all of these examples are from the D3 example page. So if you want to go and play with them, they are actually interactive and are very interesting. The uh, par parallel coordinate plot one is particularly fun to work with. So those are good starting places if you have quantitative data that you want to put into a visualization. So spatial data. There's a lot of really interesting spatial data out there. Um, most of us have interacted with GPS data, either through Google Maps or through some other GPS location device. So spatial data is 
really prevalent and something that a lot of companies traffic in. A lot of interest in spatial visualizations. But it's not just location as we would think of it. So don't limit yourself to maps. Both of these visualizations are, are spatial data. The first one is eye tracking data on the Google homepage. And it is two dimensional spatial data. They've just made a heat map of that. The visualization on the right it's actually really interesting. It's a map of what a, a computer that plays chess is thinking about mid-game. So all of those marks are the, the moves that it could make and the moves that it predicts that its opponent will make. Very interesting visualization there. That's the thinking machine number four. So if you Google that, there'll be credits at the end so you can get the full name and the, the people who made it, but it's definitely an interesting way of visualizing part of chess and also visualizing machine information. So those are places to start when you're working with spatial data. Temporal data. Timelines. They are popular for a reason. Now, time is actually one of the hardest things to visualize because often we're not really interested in the time for its own sake. We are interested in changes over time. So here you have two, possibly three dimensions, and you have time on your horizontal axis, which is relatively standard, and some other dimension on your vertical axis. In this case, the number of commercial flights in the United States. So. Yes, as I was saying, time are really hard to visualize. Often people tend towards animation because you can see things change over time. The problem with animating as a way to display time is that it's pretty difficult to compare two states that are non-adjacent. So if I want to look at two things that are, are far apart, in a time animation visualization. It's really hard to directly compare those and additional functionality has to be added in to let the user compare those two states. But in general, timelines are an excellent place to start if you're going to be visualizing temporal data. Ah, relational data. This is another really popular one. Everyone, all the time, it's all of the social networky graphy things. And as you might expect from something that is so popular, there are hundreds of ways to visualize relational data. Now, when I say relational data, I don't just mean relationships like my relationship to you all, like we are now one degree of separation, we have all been in a room together. I also mean relationships between various data points. So um, I worked with letters from the Enlightenment as one of the data sets I worked with on my thesis work. And we represented all of the relationships in that data as a graph. So if a letter was sent to the same destination country as another letter, we would consider that a connection between those two letters. So there are lots of different ways to represent relationships in data, and if you are familiar at all with databases, many databases are relational databases. Very common database structure. But back to the visualization. So on, on the left there, we have a, a network that is not just plain old, plain old network. It's actually hierarchical. Things fit into categories which are part of larger categories, which are part of lar larger categories. And this particular technique is called hierarchical edge bundling. And if you are going to be mapping your items on a circle and drawing lines between them, this is a great thing to have in your toolkit. D3 supports this. As I said, all of these examples for this section are from the D3 example page. A great thing to have. Yes? 
my apologies, I'm actually going to get to it later in the talk, but the short of it is, is it's a JavaScript library for visualization. Very common on the web right now. It makes beautiful visualizations. We'll talk more about it shortly. On the right, we have your standard node link diagram. This is great for small networks. The problem with basically all network visualization techniques is that when you get up into large data sets, they break down really badly. So if you're looking for network visualizations that will handle really large data sets, you're going to need to be creative about the questions you ask and the way you filter data. Now, that's actually a good segue. So I've said that really you're pretty limited in what one view can show you. You know, four dimensions, five dimensions if you're lucky, seven if you are really a wizard or have very special data. So what if one view isn't enough? What if I have a really highly multi-dimensional data set and I really want to be able to explore the relationships between a bunch of different dimensions? Multiple coordinated views. Now, this is the kind of visualization that is nearest and dearest to my heart because, well, who can be satisfied with only four dimensions? It's not enough. So this is a really fancy way of saying that you have one view that in some way links to another view. And it's all the same underlying data. It may be showing different dimensions of the same underlying data. But when you interact with one view, it changes what you see in the other view. So uh, in the academic sphere, you have this very fancy word for it. But most of you have been encountering this in your web 2.0 interactions for a really long time. So it's not, from an interaction perspective, particularly revolutionary to you. But I want to give you some of the vocabulary to use both to search for these techniques on your own after the talk and to understand how these views are connected in the background. So this is a visualization that I put together for a project with Intel. It was GPS data. They were interested in understanding how people related to their cars and related to their phone use in the cars. This visualization in particular is addressing the question of what makes a drive routine from a temporal perspective. So it was looking at time. And the reason I chose this particular question is because this study was taken place over like, eight different cities in three different countries. So while they were interested in the question of what makes a drive routine from a spatial perspective, it was very difficult to find some way to generalize across so many different geographies. So I started with time. This visualization is made up of a bunch of views. I don't think I have a little laser pointer, so you'll have to bear with me while I gesticulate wild wildly. So our top timeline here, the, the pink thing, that is all of the drives taken by all of the participants over the study period. And they've been layered on top of each other with transparency. So dark areas are, are place, times when more people are driving. Uh, these have been, these underlying data has been adjusted so that all of the participants' midnights line up. OK, so that's one view, this top pinkish timeline. The next one is sort of a similar idea, except instead of layering all of the participants on top of each other, we have one line for each participant as we follow them over the 30-day period. All right, so that's view number two. View number three is this timeline of green blocks here. And that shows, for an individual participant, their drives over the entire period, just one drive per little block. Uh, in this case, and you may not be able to read this, the orange highlighted participant, that's Rogerio, pseudonym of course, um, his drives are being shown in our bottom timeline there. So that's view number three. 
View number four is here. This bottom little table, which if you selected a drive in the green timeline, it would appear there so that you could see the details, like the exact speed, exact average speed, the number of stops you took, so on and so forth. OK, so that's view number four. Then, and I'm not going to go through each of these individually, in, on the far right, you have all of these lists. And these are your control surfaces. Hello. Oh, try not to fall backwards over the filing cabinet. So at the top, on the top right, you have these little check boxes that it says filter on. So by selecting a dimension of the data, because each of those check boxes represents a dimension of the data, you can then go into the corresponding list for that dimension of the data and filter all of the other views on that data. So for instance, I can filter out, let's say I'm interested in gender and country. So I can filter all of the data by gender and country and say, for instance, see only the women driving in China or only the men in Germany, that kind of thing. So that's one technique, all of that talking, I know, for one technique, and that's filtering. Being able to interactively change what the views are showing so you can see only what you care about. OK, so it's actually two techniques. And the second one is brushing and linking. So the filtering changes the underlying data that's being shown. And the brushing and linking is how you know that something has changed, well, other than the data disappearing from your screen. Brushing and linking, again, fancy, fancy academic term for when I click on something in one view, it highlights in another. That's all it means. It means that there is some linkage between the two views, and there is some visual indication of the linkage. So in this case, uh, I've highlighted the participant Rogerio. I've, I've selected that participant. And then his timeline in the blue visualization turns orange. Orange, so I know that I have selected Rogerio from a list. And then his little timeline pops up in the bottom. If I select one of those, it puts a little black box around it so I can tell that that is the drive that has been selected and it's linked to the table at the bottom. So brushing and linking, it is the underpinning of basically every multiple coordinated view visualization. All right, another one which uses brushing and linking but builds on it is focus plus context. So here we have two views. Uh, we have a context view on the bottom, little timeline, and that shows the whole thing, like the entire timeline of whatever we're looking at. I think this might be stock data. Again, it's a D3 example and it's primarily, this one is for showing this particular technique, focus plus context. So you have a context view, which is an overview of the data, and that helps the user locate themselves, see how they, where they are in the data in relationship to the data as a whole. Really useful view. And then you have your focus view. This is the details. Um, and you can see like, where it's selected in the context view. So you have some, some way of indicating a selection to the user, and then you have this detail picture that you can zoom in on. Again, this is one of the primary visual interaction linking techniques. All right. I've talked a lot about sort of how to get to the building of visualizations. And you want to know how to actually build visualizations. So let's talk a little about tools. D3.js is a very, very popular visualization library right now. It's in JavaScript. Uh, it's open source. It was, I believe, written by Mike Bostock, I think. It's mostly his GitHub. Some, there's nodding. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, it makes beautiful visualizations, like really, really beautiful visualizations. Um, they are rendered with SVG, which something vector graphics. 
scalable vector graphics. Thank you, Emily. Uh, and they're beautiful. They are really, really beautiful. However, my main complaint with D3 is it has sort of limited support for multiple coordinated views. You can build them if you're really familiar with JavaScript. I'm not. And I'm also sort of lazy in my coordination. I want my visualization libraries to really support coordination well. So as great interactivity support for single views, um, it has some support for multiple coordinated views, as shown by the focus plus context visualization, uh, but sort of limited on the scale of multiple coordinated views that I'm accustomed to. Also, because it is run in your user's browser, has sort of limited support for big data sets. If you've got something really, really giant, and someone's trying to run it on their inky dinky laptop, it may or may not go as well as you had hoped. I have occasionally uh, crashed my own browser trying to do really big things in D3. Okay, so that's one option. Yes? Um, so what I was trying to visualize was um, 500,000 different transactions. Could be user error. Yeah, so, and there are, there are definitely ways of aggregating data so that you don't have to deal with 500,000 different individual transactions. Um, it really depends on your data set. Those are the, the problems that I have encountered. So another thing that I use is Improvise. Uh, full disclosure, this was written by, as a PhD dissertation by the advisor for my master's thesis. So I didn't have any choice but to learn Improvise. And it is a Java-based desktop design environment. You both build your visualizations in Improvise and then distribute them to your users and they open them in Improvise. It's something like Excel in that manner. Uh, it is incredibly powerful. It is incredibly flexible. If you want to do tightly coordinated multiple view visualizations, uh, it would be hard, you'd be hard pressed to find a better tool for it than this. Unfortunately, uh, learning to Improvise is kind of like climbing a cliff with your teeth. If you're interested, I will be happy to get you started. And uh, if there's interest, I'd be glad to put on a workshop. It is free. It is both free and open source. And I am just about to do Maven integration. So if you're interested, I can give you even the crazy experimental stuff that I have written. So I'll be putting that up on some kind of code sharing something sometime soon. Uh, I like Improvise. I am planning in the future to move it to um, hostable server code so that it actually render, it, it builds on the server and can render on a user's device so that there are uh, more data big stuff. Right. So, since this talk is about data wrangling, I do want to mention the power of scripting languages. I love Python for data wrangling. Like, if I've got something messy and nasty, and when I was brought onto the Intel project, I had just a, a boatload of really strange file formats and like proprietary sensor data and all of this really weird random stuff that I needed to pull together into a consistent structured format. And I did that all with Python. It was great. Additionally, um, I do want to say about Improvise. Improvise is really not very good for rapid prototyping of visualizations. Improvise is great for building in the products when you kind of know exactly what you want to show. Um, but you, it is good to pair with a tool where you can rapidly churn out visualizations to see, OK, is this an interesting thing or not? Uh, and for that, Python is great. If you like MATLAB but don't like closed source proprietary software, uh, Python's matplotlib is OK, just about as painful as MATLAB, but it produces top-notch visualizations, especially when you're trying to build things quickly. Uh, there's also ggplot, which if you are an R user, R is another popular language in this sphere. It ha has a great visualization 
library, which has now been ported to Python. So great language for data wrangling. I imagine if you have a scripting language that you already like, you can also wrangle data in that. Now, you are a little bit better prepared to go forth and visualize. I would like to thank Flickr and all of these awesome users for Creative Commons licensing their stuff so that I can have a pretty presentation for you today. Any questions? It's true. Hans Rosling has a fantastic te TED talk about his Gapminder software, and I actually had a screenshot of that that didn't make the cut in this deck. Uh, it's sadly uh, yes, yes. But it is it is very pretty to watch, and if you're interested at all in world health data and statistics, that's a great place to look. Um, if you are there, are, there are lots of different interesting tools. IBM produced Many Eyes. Uh, which is, again, sort of open data visualization platform. So that's a, another interesting thing to look at if you just want to play around with things. I haven't worked extensively with Tableau. Tableau Software up in Seattle, they make another visualization tool for multiple coordinated view visualizations. I don't believe it is open source, which is my preference, but... Yes, and I believe that to share the visualizations, you have to be willing to make them public online, which depending on your, uh, your data and your predilections, that may not be possible. So, yes? Is a data I consider it to be a, a subset of the giant, nebulous, possibly imaginary umbrella of data science. Um, definitely as a research area, it is a fully-fledged research community. There are lots of people in various academic realms doing their own thing, and there are certainly, um, I, I'm on a, a, a list for data visualization jobs. It's a Google group, um, I believe, founded by Lynn Cherney who is also on Twitter, and you should look her up. And I get emails in my inbox every day looking for a data visualizer. So I would say that definitely it is, it is an area worthy of specialization, and it is likely that you will be able to find work in the future as the interest in data increases and as our ability to, to manage large data sets increases. We also have to be able to provide value. And the thing about visualization that is different from a lot of, of machine learning and data mining techniques is that visualization leverages the amazing pattern matching abilities of the human brain. There are a lot of patterns that are actually really difficult to describe to a computer in a way that it can match. So visualization lets us leverage what people are good at, which is finding patterns. Yes, Akashic Labs, we have been around for a little under a year. August 13th is our one year anniversary. And uh, we are happy to visualize things for you. Right now we're working mostly with electronic medical, electronic medical records, which is a lot of fun. Uh, but we like all different kinds of data. Yes. Oh man, I was afraid that someone's asking me something like this. Um, I am not a D3 expert. I am still very much in the, I have 
written the code exactly like the aligned left tutorial man like why is it still not working debugging in javascript is um you know hard enough uh julie pagano actually wrote a post on it recently i recommend going to check that out but for d3 itself no i'm sorry i have no no tools to suggest to you You could translate that as, there are lots of things that can go wrong. <laughs> of course, that's true with any software. I'm going to interrupt you for just a moment because I want to throw in one more thought. If you are a little nervous about D3 now, Vega is a, graph, a grammar on top of D3, and it is much more user friendly, at least for simple things. I have not explored it for doing complex things, but if you just want to bang out you know, an interactive map or something, Vega is, the learning curve is a lot shallower. V A or V E G A. So thank you all for your time. I will be in the Hacker Lounge tomorrow. You will know me by the top hat with tentacles that I will have with me. <laughs>